of a much larger uh, project that started almost two years ago um, when Storefront submitted a proposal to the State Department to try to bring a project to Venice. Uh, this project was called Office Us. Office Us is, a, is an aspiration. It's a project that what wants to do is to bring history and architecture and all the different individuals that have been invested in the making of cities and territories around the globe and together to try to reimagine what are the protocols and the mechanisms and the forces and the individuals and the drivers that are behind the making of architecture to try to reimagine them anew. With that very humble aspiration, um, Office Us um, arrived in Venice with um, a body of work that compiled um, all the architecture that US architects have been building in on a global scale from since 1914 to 2014. Those almost 200 offices that represented those buildings, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly ones, all of them together, um, tried to bring together for the first time architecture under a much different lens. A lens that tries to simply see that what it is and, and in that sense try to rewrite the notes and the points of inflection that constitute the making and teaching and sometimes the learning and the distribution of ideas in architecture. So I'm going to make that introduction very short, but um, these are two of the evidences, apart from the film. The, the, the thin one started um, accompanying uh, Office As from the very beginning, Office US Agenda. The second one, the Atlas, is perhaps um, very similar to what the architects somehow does. This little circle is, um, if we would make a little section to this book, maybe we would encounter a very similar cinematographical parallel um, to the film. But I want to thank Andrew Fierberg, who is here somewhere in the audience, mostly because this film started uh, uh, through the conversations that I had with him, trying to bring um, Office As into the medium of, um, of the cinematic world. And I also want to thank Elise and Jeffrey Brown, who are also somewhere here in the audience, for actually supporting uh, uh, Storefront and supporting uh, this project uh, the same day that I actually I, I told them about the film, I told them what work Amy had at the Met at the time. And, um, and so I'm sure that you're all familiar with the speakers today, so I just really want to welcome them and I would like to ask you to uh, welcome this incredible um, speakers and uh, and opponents and I want to thank you Amy for actually having worked with us uh, through this uh, uh, endless project that in fact is going to come uh, to New York, Office is going to open in New York as a new institute in the fall. So we think of this piece of this exhibition, this space of convergence as a space of encounter for many of the people who were not part of the project in Venice and that actually want to bring them in, in this project as it moves on. So. With all that said, I just want to give the word to Juliana and let's get the conversation going. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be back here at Storefront on the high schools to uh, uh, celebrate Amy Siegel's uh, new work and have a dialogue with her and Greg and Eva um, about the architects. Uh, this is one of the many wonderful films that you have made. Uh, that deal with architecture, space, and design, uh, and follows the uh, really stunning film uh, Provenance, uh, but also DDR, DDR, that we would make an equity. Um, it, the, the earlier films seem to have um, an interest in dealing with historically fraught spaces, uh, and in a way, defamiliarizing them and reinventing them. And this, to a certain extent, does that with the architectural offices, except that it's all in the contemporary. And also, it's saying something about the future, in, I think, of architecture. Um, the, one of the first things that come to mind is it's, um, it's the office, uh, not the studio. Uh, as I was uh, watching this being made in production and uh, seeing the product, I was reminded of a beautiful painting by Charbel uh, from 1725, one of my favorite paintings of still lives uh, called The Attributes of the Architect. Uh, and in 1725, the architectural studio looked like a painter's studio. There was a table for drawing, there was paper to draw, there were 
uh, instruments to design and, and measure. And there were books, remember those things, books. Um, and so cut to 2013, um, and there we are in a completely different kind of situation. Um, so no longer the painter studio, but also no longer the artisanal, in a sense, a studio. Uh, although some of our architects' friends still call it a studio, but most of them really have grown to become, uh, if not corporate offices, like really big offices with many employees. Um, the title, um, The Architects, Not the Architect or the Star Architect. Uh, so who are these architects? In a way, um, the workers <laughs> in the factory of, of architecture, uh, to a certain extent, the people who are actually making um, the work. Um, and, uh, and how you, um, how you show them, in fact, I think this is, is now not working anymore. All right, um, and uh, most importantly, I think the way in which you show the offices, uh, these fantastically beautiful, minimal, uh, pristine, long take, tracking and dolly shots that, that sort of survey the spaces uh, at a very specific angle. Um, as you look at them, you are actually at the same height as the tables. Uh, that everyone is sitting on. I thank you. Oops. Um, that everyone is sitting uh, sitting on, uh, and obviously these are all completely different offices. But to a certain extent, there is something interesting and perhaps disturbing that we could talk about about making it like almost a seamless space. You know, kind of uh, putting together offices of different sizes and different kinds of uh, interests. Um, small offices like low tech to big corporate offices like KPF. Uh, while the tracking shots, in a sense, continues through all of this, you know, making them. And I think, you know, probably some of the critique or the interest or, uh, is in this particular uh, moment of montage that looks like a document, but in a way, it's it's really entirely your own construction. Um, and I was, you know, reminded in. It's also the. The idea of using the long takes, and this is, uh, I think, one of the uh, uh, the beautiful things that you also did in Provenance, that 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 is coming back here to to sort of track through people and objects, and to track through their histories and through their spaces, uh, with no voiceover, no the very minimal dialogue in any ways, and just letting the space speak for itself. And as we were, you know, thinking about the possible antecedents of our architectures being depicted in film. It seemed to me that this was almost like a contemporary version of, of uh, playtime. Uh, in uh, Jacques Tati's uh, playtime, play. without the play, uh, you, uh, most of you have seen it. It's a fantastic film uh, that made in 1967 that begins with a kind of statement that I think is similar to your uh, montage of, of the offices. So you walk. You don't walk. I like the way in which I almost feel like I walk into a movie. You walk into the space that, and it looks like maybe it's an office, maybe it's a hospital, and it turns out to be an airport. Uh, and in a way, this, this kind of idea of how different kinds of spaces in different places in different time can be condensed into by this movement, by this tracking into one apparently seamless, seamless thing is uh, similar. And in there, there was obviously a critique of modern architecture, of the international style of architecture. And here, I wonder you know, to which extent what you're doing is, uh, is both uh, a fascination with and a critique of you know, the world uh, of architecture at the same time. Uh, the lateral perspective also um, makes me think of your interest in um, empathy in an interesting way. I mean, uh, a lot of people have, you know, might have think of this as very cold or cool or detached. And to a certain extent it is, but to my mind it really isn't. A way of expressing a particular kind of empathy um, with space and objects and things. And I'm, I'm thinking of uh, empathy in the sense of Einfühlung, uh, where it came from, uh, from the turn of the last century's involvement in the aesthetics of empathy one not only empathizes with people, one empathizes with space. 
uh, with objects, with color, with things, with moods, with atmospheres. Uh, and I find that you know, this use of this kind of lateral perspective uh, that glides uh, through the surface of things is, is also uh, uh, something that makes us uh, really uh, come close to uh, to, the, to the place in a, in a kind of interesting, uh, in an interesting way. So these silent conversations, in a way, take place between us and the world of objects. I mean, there are um, there are things, um, uh, screens, tables, uh, models, uh, little people being made into models, uh, people cutting models, different kinds of uh, ways of gliding through, you know, magazines and things, uh, and to a certain extent, one could also say that people and objects may be equated at certain times, that there's a way in which um, you look at, people look into screens, uh, they mostly don't look into camera, uh, they're, they're, they're constructing their own world, um, and, uh, and these are, in a sense, the, the workers. Uh, and another, you know, another kind of a film connection seems to me, uh, going all the way back to the early uh, history of cinema, to the panorama films where this movement through the space of the cities documented uh, the life of the city at the time. So the industrialization, uh, the movement, uh, the, the means of transportation, everything that was happening was, was actually made with these kinds of, they didn't really have tracking shots, but they put cameras on everything that moved to show this kind of movement. Uh, and I was particularly reminded of the Lumiere brothers uh, workers exiting the factory. Uh, so this idea of, of the documenting in a way with movement, uh, uh, a moment uh, in time. But it's not a documentary, it's a document. And this is a very different thing, because there's a lot of construction uh, obviously going on uh, into this, uh, in what you're doing. And, and at the same time, um, a, a kind of commentary uh, in a way, on the work on the on the architects themselves, um, it uh, you know I, I mean this lot of discussion around what you do in terms of uh, your involvement with your with the with the objects that you think about. I mean, yes, in provenance, the movement of things shows the flow of capital, and here, in some way, uh, it's the stillness of the offices uh, and the movement of the camera that is meditating upon what's happening you know, to, to the world of architecture. And uh, in terms of, you know, we see a lot of faces as well, though. Uh, it's all faceless. It may look as if the offices have become, to a certain extent, very similar with this rawness. And so there's a sort of facelessness to the, uh, to, to the, to the construction of the offices. But, um, but their faces, there's a lot more women that one can think of, a lot more some diversity, at least in terms of Asian uh, faces that are populating uh, these particular offices. And, uh, you know, I mean, last uh, but not least, I think, I think I'd think i like you know, to think a little bit about the idea of the stillness in relation to the motion. Um, in a way, we, this is where the world is being constructed, uh, but staring at a screen and always outside the window. Uh, we never exit. Uh, and yet, you know, what's actually being made is somewhere out there. So there is a kind of interesting uh, uh, combination uh, and, and attention between uh, the movement and flow of globalization, at the same time, the sort of stillness that it has produced even in the making of, uh, of architecture. And, I, I, in, and, you know, in the montage is, uh, I mean, I'm very curious about uh, hearing about your choices of the offices and, and how you edited this together and how, to a certain extent, such different modes of production uh, in such different spaces, you know, uptown, downtown, Brooklyn, uh, small offices where principals show up, like Lotech, uh, uh, Ada and Giuseppe Perignano appear to finally uh, are in there in the offices while most offices are not populated by the principals. But, the architects. So how, in a sense, the, 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 seam, the apparently seamless camera movement you know, connects all of this together with a fascination for the things themselves. I think the only time, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
um, that the camera changes direction is when you get fascinated by the 3D printer. Uh, it's going to be a <laughs> delightful. The object that's making things is going kind of back and forth, back. It's a beautiful shot, back and forth, back and forth. And then, there you know, in a way, you know, what the accoutrements are. And what that takes us all the way back to Chardin. Perhaps it's no longer uh, the piece of paper and the drawing, but there's still instruments and things that, that produce stuff that you have a particular sensibility for. So they function like the couches in, uh, in provenance for me. Okay, I'll just add a few comments because I think it's just a wonderful introduction and framing to uh, to this terrific film. I really enjoyed seeing it uh, and seeing it in relation to other recent works like Provenance. I had maybe rather than give an extended uh, gloss to your gloss, I will just begin to frame some questions. You put on the table the, the question of the tracking shot. I think that's absolutely central. And of course, this is a, a form that recurs at different moments within the history of cinema, and which bears a certain relationship to architectural space. It can be struck in a sense, a kind of space. So I'd love to hear more about your decision about the tracking, first of all, how it differs from, say, from your use of that in, in Provenance, uh, but also to throw another reference on the table, you brought up playtime. Uh, I'd bring up two. Uh, one, uh, Berlin Symphony der Kurstadt, yeah. uh, and the early city films yes. in which, in fact, this movement across the city becomes likened to a cross section. Right? And that seems to be really what's partly at work within this film is that the tracking becomes an analog for uh, a kind of sectional understanding of contemporary architectural offices today. I think indeed some of the biggest offices, and what does the section then reveal? This kind of cinematic section for the office, um, and what resists the, the, the type of uh, device in the section? Anyway, that's a, another question for me. Um, the other reference that in my mind is sort of my favorite uh, tracking shot, which is Godard's weekend, uh, when all the, the, trying to get out of the city, all the cars are stuck, and in fact, uh, your effort to get out of the city uh, is impeded, but the camera moves outside the cars and begins to pan along, or begins to track along, sorry, the, uh, the cars which are stuck in traffic, and you begin to see the life in those cars, you begin to see disasters that creep into the frame. Uh, and if the, if Symphony der Großstadt uh, engaged a kind of pleasure in moving into the city, moving through the city, a kind of uh, freedom to sort of pass through walls, to pass through solid barriers, which I think we get in the tracking shots here, in, the, in those very delicate cuts where we move from office to office, we, we seem to be passing through imaginary walls. It gives us that feeling of a sort of a, an incredible ability to move through spaces. With the Godard, it's, it's the opposite in a sense. The tracking enters into a relationship with frustration. Mm -hmm. In fact, this movement that's been arrested by uh, the traffic jam, in which the tracking shot then begins to play with and undo through its ability to free itself from that traffic jam. So I wonder. If you, there's not a sense similarly of frustration uh, and an ability for the tracking shot to to speak to a, a type of frustration, a, an immobility, much in, in or somehow in relationship to the way that Godard does that uh, within uh, Weekend. Second, I would like to sort of push a little bit uh, both on Ava and Amy and, and uh, query a little bit more the status of the us in Office Us. Uh, who is this us? And in what way uh, does the tracking produce a certain sense of us? Is it uh, us as belonging to a, an architectural community within the office? What is that community within the office? What is that us that you're creating? I think the, the Giovanni observation about the positioning of the camera at the level of the desk, it's so um, clear at the beginning that this is uh, the view not from, uh, say, a walking body or even a standing body, but a sitting body, and, and a body that's maybe on wheels like an office chair rolling through the offices, and I thought that immediately puts us in a kind of, uh, a sort of position of a mobile worker, in a sense, that's sort of drifting through the offices. Uh, but we're not workers either, we're, we're sort of voyeurs of, of a working condition, and I wanted to you know, hear more about that. Finally, I, uh, I would be very interested to hear you say a little bit about, not just the offices, but uh, the images of images within the film. So it begins with an image of a skyline, and a skyline that is becoming familiar to us even though it's quite new, with uh, the sort of micro towers on 59th Street. We see that as if it might be uh, uh, an animation. And then the camera moves and we realize that in fact, no, this is a, uh, 
a still image, and it's an image of an image that we look at, and this recurs again and again through the film, and in part we even begin to understand which office we're in by looking at those images. You think, ah, oh, this must be Bob's office. And, you, know, you, you begin to see the offices not through the architects, but through the architecture, through the models, through the renderings that we see. Uh, and that's a very different type of, of uh, movement, I would say, within the film. It's actually a, a kind of animation, in a sense, of these still images uh, that you very carefully uh, brought very close to the lens at various moments, which make us feel as if we're within the rendering, rather than looking at a framed image. So uh, I guess those are my three observations and questions. And, uh, Maybe I could start, I loved your role in chair. <laughs> and if only it were that easy. <laughs> um, but I, I love that because I, I tend to find that with each work, it somehow picks up and explodes some small detail in a prior work or some, some aspect of a prior work. Um, and in provenance, for example, it was a sort of micro history of a Eastern and molded injected plastic chair that makes a short journey, a two minute journey in a 135 minutes home. Um, and sort of provenance exaggerates and amplifies that, and it becomes the entire work. And in, but in provenance, there's a long parallel tracking shot of um, where you see not the Le Corbusier and Pierre Genere chairs that are original to Chandigarh, but you see the new chairs that have replaced them, the ergonomic kind of green chairs that are task chairs. And I think that this piece is in the way we're going to think of it in that in that relationship is an explosion of that or an amplification of that shot. Right, yeah. So you're in the you know you're in the new you're in the new work environment, the desired work environment, which is key to the computer and to that length. Um, but and just, you, you all brought up so many, both of you brought up so many interesting things. I, I really don't know where um, to start. But but maybe also to talk about you spoke about weekend um, also. Um, the Walter Ruttman, and then um, Playtime. The film, I mean, those films are in mind, but in a way, um, I think for me, the film that, or the, the sort of proto image in my, in my mind, was Alfred Hitchcock's rope. <laughs> um, because it unfolds in a single day in New York City, and because New York City, except for the very, very, the, there's one shot at the very beginning that's exterior of the building that the whole entire film takes place in. Everything else is that beautiful, amazing matte painting and model set that they made in the studio and that lights up over the course of the day and the clouds kind of change colors and, and move through it sort of like the Queens Museum model of New York. Um, but the sense of the view being always and only outside the window. Yeah, and that you, you never sort of enter the city except for but, and also, of course, the structural device of the 12-minute camera rolls that sort of dictates, and the hiding behind coats and coffins, <laughs> you know, to, to duck the camera out and to get into the new camera roll. So if anyone hasn't seen Rope, um, it is structured by 12 takes, basically, 12 camera rolls. It's rumored to be a continuous film, but it's not. Much like Wave Lake, <laughs> which is the opposite yeah. movement, the movement in. But and also to say, um, you know, speaking of the movement in, the lateral movement is a, is a interesting reference because for me, um, I think the you know the Brian Henderson essay um, toward non bourgeois camera style. I think for myself and, and actually several other artists of the same generation I've spoken with about this, it was very important to kind of consider what. For me, is the difference between tracking laterally and tracking forward mm -hmm. um, in terms of a cinematic language. That when you track forward, you involve psychologically. You sort of are alerting us to we're getting closer and closer to understanding something. Um, and when you track laterally, you're sort of always maintaining the image as an act of representation and an act of surveillance. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think there's I don't think there's a, a lack of empathy. I think there's a different kind of empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, you know, goes to what you were saying about this kind of mind film, this um, understanding of empathy. Because there is, of course, a distance in the frame, and it's, it's an analytical one, and it plays off of certain other tropes that we know from um, 
artist film as well as the history of cinema. I think for me, um, in the early cinema references, since we're doing cinema references, we can start there. Um, it's actually, you know, one could think of George, the Georgetown Loop, even though that's a forward movement, but because it, it just keeps recycling, but also, um, well, for me, it's always man with the movie camera, and it's always the moment where it cuts from the car, is the, the tripod is in the car, and you see what it's filming, and then it cuts back to seeing the man with the tripod. You know, that you have this kind of secondary moment of cutting back and seeing the active representation unfolding after you see what is being represented or caught by that camera. Mm -hmm. And that sort of cutting back is always interesting to me, and sort of adopt the sort of, the idea of, um, that the film adopts the sort of system, you know, the behavior of the system it describes in some way. And that, obviously in the 3D printer, is, is the clearest, most acute moment of that, absolutely. So just a quick specific question about the printer. What's in the printer? It looks like it's the screen that's the exact aspect ratio of the screen, is that is that right? I don't know if it's exact, but it's pretty close. Okay, so the printer is, is an analog for the screen in this type of moment. Yeah, I asked them to print something that they probably would very rarely print, which is just a wall. Because normally, <laughs> normally the printer moves like this, you know, and right. it, go, it goes all over. But I didn't want it to do that because okay. I needed my shot to just move <laughs> like my shot. Like yeah. shot. <laughs> but I also wanted it to be creating the very screen, like a miniature of the screen. So, so there's a model inside of the printer but it's a model for the artwork itself or for the surface upon which the artwork gets projected or comes to life. Uh, just to you know, continue this conversation about the lateral uh, movement and, and, um, and the editing. I mean, in, in the menu, the movie camera, um, or in many of the other city films, in, in a way, the, the apparatus uh, is visible. Yeah, and uh, you, in some way, tend to make it very visible in terms of the movement, but the apparatus itself is not. And the editing appears to be seamless. Um, so not only do you not move into a space, you don't cut into a space, you don't chop up the space, you don't, you, you don't move in. So to a certain extent, I mean, and I, I love what you said about wavelength. You know, it's not that perceptual psychic motion that makes you close to something, but something that really surveys. But I think some of the interesting things also comes in this relation between the, the lateral motion and, and, and the editing, because very often you change spaces by making a wall being a partition or a connector between uh, two things. Or, or a window becomes a, uh, another point of view. So, um, you know, and I, I think, I mean, I'm really curious about the way in which you chose uh, how to edit this together and how to make, and what's involved in this kind of um, uh, editing that in a way makes something appear seamless that is not at all. You know, it's almost as if you're, you're tricking us to say, um, this is a continuous movement through the way this works, but if you really look at it, these are completely different practices. And, and is there something perverse in there that wants us to? Which are wait, which are completely different? Well, like I say, you have you have different offices that um, <coughs> that are some are very small, some are very corporate. The practices of the offices, and, and so in a way, instead of instead of marking that uh, in any way. Uh, way the visible, let's say, you know, kind of cinematic device that, that, that makes you aware of it, you let us continue to survey and, and in a sense we're looking at, or you're trying to decipher as we try to decipher in a situation where we are really surveying something. You know, it's like we become a detective. But who is this? You know, what, what kind of practice is this? And it's our eyes that have to go in uh, rather than you taking us. Uh, in there, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think when I when I started the project, um, I spoke with Ava because I'd gone to maybe two or three offices, not knowing, having some idea in mind, but not this exactly. And um, I said to Ava, 
God, the offices I saw, they really look the same. <laughs> and they have this funny desk set up, and it's, it's like a one long continuous desk. It sort of feels like that. Right. Um, or rows and rows of continuous desks. And they just said, yeah, they're all like that. <laughs> Something to that extent, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and I said, really? Okay, so can I see some, some more pictures or do you have suggestions of um, other offices? Um, that also fulfill that, and in fact, there were many. So I think we went and visited something like 14 o only, and then we used 10 of them, and maybe the ones we didn't use just because they were, they became a little redundant. I mean, because of course, once you start to gather a kind of a sameness, you also start to see difference, and then the difference becomes exaggerated because you've created a language that's entirely its own world and kind of unto itself. And then things start to differentiate. Um, and the differences are, are quite marked, I think. I mean, for example, here, the, the um, amazing lamps, right. um, <laughs> which gives some indication of who's, who's on who's office, office that is. is. <laughs> yeah. And that was also interesting to me. I mean, I was just very struck by the, the sort of, the first thing that struck me is that the, that the makers of space, as it were, as I think of them, the, the, their own spaces don't, didn't seem to me that differentiated at first. And of course now they seem kind of highly nuanced to me within that. But, and that's, you know, hence in some sense the editing is thinking about what are the differences because, you know, the goal of most Hollywood editing is continuity editing. And with something like this, it's, it's going to be like you have to move against the idea of continuity while at the same time maintaining it. So there's a, a rhythmic continuity, and then you know, how am I going to get in and out of the space? Are we going to go through black? How are we going to how are we going to do that? And so we set up a lot of moments of going to black, for example, mm -hmm. um, as well as using the walls and dividers that were naturally there. Um, but again, I think this issue of sort of what what do you move into, and is it is it a moment of difference, you know, a kind of violent difference, as opposed to um, what what came before? <coughs> Maybe for women, that what was what was always incredible is when when we showed this film in Venice. Um, many architects they started wondering what would happen if the architects was filmed not in New York but in LA or in Milan or in other uh, contexts where the landscape of the office is not. Uh, uh, so close to a city and to an architecture that is specific to a particular architectural landscapes in, in New York. And, and when, when I, you actually said, can you go and see some offices, right? This was the fifth time that we had actually asked more than like, 30 offices in New York for some model, either their manual, their office manual, as a way to try to bring all those different individual offices together and to try to find a lens of inquiry, transversal forms of actually understanding what was the difference and what was the sameness that was actually making these architectures so different from another one, right? And today we are having conversations within the architectural field about questions of labor or about questions of obviously of uh, equity. And uh, but what for me was fascinating appeared, right? And because it, it did appear, I mean, we had been working and we have been discussing this forever, and 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 the idea of having this uh, traveling uh, um, as a as a as a section or cut as a drawing line through all the different offices that we didn't want to even name recognize if they were ten or nine or twenty five because in fact they are standing here for themselves but for much larger uh, edifice that is the architectural edifice uh, of architectural production today is the idea of operational transparency, right? How beyond the glass, right, that the camera is producing, we are actually able and capable of seeing other things that otherwise do not become apparent to us. And, and this idea of trying to not just make a, a documentary, right, because it is not, because it is a fiction, but the truth is, is that even within the fiction, there is a high degree of reality. Even stage is that the degree of reality is so much bigger than the staging. So what, like, the idea of like the hyper documentary, right? And I think that that's for me, is that, is that it's um, um, 
inspiration as an autonomous piece. In fact, it documents much better than if we would have aspired to probably do a documentary in that regard. So I'm trying to figure out within your, um, within your own understanding um, of the spaces that you visited, um, we never actually thought of having a different way of filming them, right? It was never another option. And um, there is this moment in which you stop as well when uh, at the studio, the photo studio, mm -hmm. right? And, and you click. Yeah. And there is that moment of observation. Um, I haven't seen all the leftovers that, that you didn't use. Did you, did you stop anywhere else? You mean in the entire shooting? Oh, probably. I mean, you know, because shooting for me, filming is like a kind of choreography. You alter the choreography as you go, and you try different things out. I mean, the idea that every take is the same and just better is like totally foreign to me, other than the camera movement and getting it sort of smooth. So each one is a variation on the next. And, and in this way, you kind of produce a problem in the editing if you want to cross the takes, which obviously I'm not going to do in this instance, cross cut anything. But classically, that would be a huge problem and why people avoid it. But for me, it's always this kind of trying out different things. So I'm sure that we stopped in many different places. And also, you see, you see things as you're on the dolly, riding it, as it were, sort of moving across. And unfold because it's unfolding in real time and it's not to a certain you may set up you may ask all the people to go sit in the conference room for example but you know what they do in there it's a certain dynamic quality that you can't entirely control or, or that I wouldn't want to entirely control because they're going to do things that and then that differentiates that moment you know from an earlier take let's say so the, I mean the moment where the camera stops on the model and in the photography studio is also a reiteration of a trope that appears, you know, there are, there are things in the architects that are, appear across other works of mine and in other works of mine, even the title of the film comes from a film, an East German, the last East German film studio film ever made is called The Architects, Die Architekten, and it appears in my film DDR, DDR. And so there's some way in which that, that film, which was, um, made when the wall came down and became, it was a total flop because they had to decide whether to continue with the fiction of the GDR when the GDR had already ended or to kind of adapt to this normal moment and they decided to continue with the fiction. So it was already out of date, you know, by the time it came out. But that kind of belatedness is really fascinating. But, but maybe actually, um, you know, the photo studio reappears in my work, it's in provenance, it's in a new piece, it's in the architects. And that the sort of moment of I mean, it's sort of the quintessential moment of the representation, the sort of act of representation and representing the act in and of itself and that kind of self-reflexivity, which is, which is to me very, very different than the verite yeah. filmmaker catching himself in the mirror with his handheld apparatus, you know, which is the really scene of the apparatus. And I'm much more interested in the work scene itself somehow or not enacting its own kind of behavior in some way, or enacting that kind of moment of reflexivity. That it's not reflected literally in the mirror or seen, but it's enacted or performed you know, within its own technology. And you know, I think wavelength also comes back, just to say, um, in those spaces where these are, because many of the downtown spaces are sort of like the loft of that wavelength that's filmed in after gentrification. And that's, that's a beautiful comment. And I mean, it, it seems like one of the things that the, the parallel tracking is tracking here is the layout of the office, right? I mean, these long uh, corridors in which you have these head-to-head -head desks where you have uh, people working at computers facing each other. And this has become now an almost ubiquitous condition within larger offices. And to go back to your point, Juliana, about yeah. an older configuration, this is what this is displaced in a sense is the drafting table. If you look at the plans within the Office US Tome, uh, the drafting table, which was one or two per table gapped out, uh, would have produced a condition for a tracking shot. So you've, you've tracked, in a sense, the, the physiognomy of the office at the level of the plan. And I wanted to go back to the question of empathy in that regard and to ask, with what are we empathizing in this condition? Are we empathizing with people at desks? Are we empathizing with a kind of 
landscape of production. Empathy is traditionally, in a sense, understood as a type of embodied projection uh, into something that faces you. And here we're not facing people, we're, we're kind of passing through it. So just a question about empathy there. And the, another question that would come off of that is, why think about architecture today only through the office? What is happening within architecture does not stop within the office. It connects with other offices where people are doing other types of work, whether it's financial work or rendering work or uh, insurance work. It continues to the building site where there's people uh, working, both architects and, and builders. So why the focus on the office and what do we get by <coughs> empathizing with the office? <laughs> Empathy, my specialty? <laughs> no, it's, it's your specialty too. <laughs> I mean, a whole film called Empathy. It was an invisible question mark. In the end, no, no. Well, I, no, I don't, I mean, it, I don't think you empathize with people. That's not the point. You don't empathize with people. That's why this is interestingly, you know, uh, different. Then, uh, and it's connected to what we were saying about tracking uh, the office. I mean, in, in, in continuity, Hollywood continuity style, in order to make you empathize, you cut. Uh, you cut into a close-up or you move into a space and you, you're directing the gaze of the spectator towards the person that you want to feel empathetic with. I mean, the, the close-up was, was really born out of that idea. Then you have, you have no close-ups here whatsoever and you don't move into space, you move laterally. But I still maintain that there is an empathy there, not in the sense of empathizing with people, but in the sense of that empathy is actually also empathy with space. Uh, I mean, I really believe this Theodor Lips idea that one empathizes with objects and things and spaces, and, and, and one feels it through a certain kind of movement uh, through them. And so you both, I mean, to me, this both maintains a detachment because, uh, because there is a way in which you you know, you glide through, you don't stop, you, you do not make us feel like, oh, here, here, you know, this is like this beautiful little thing over there, the tidy, all the way back there, it's a fantastic little object, I want this, you know, but, but, but you end up having the spectator actually doing this kind of work of feeling, as you were saying, I think it's also empathy with the making of things, you know, the, the self-reflexivity, the things doing themselves, you know. Yeah, but I think that's it's not it in this kind of speculative. No, way. it's not. It's not no, it's in that not, kind of. Right. Like you're not. It's not that they have a life of their own. No. As objects. No. It's, for me, it's the projection of the self into the object, yeah. and then it's sort of return back to the you know to the act of, of the projection. It's always sort of like one. It's always like this kind of transference, counter-transference moment. But that's empathy. I mean, empathy is a sense mm -hmm. of projection from yeah. the self into the object and back. From the object to yeah, itself, which is why so that, that's that's why I think it it works. It's not it's it's always psychic you know, in some way. But yeah, but I mean with empathy, the film, for example, yeah, it began no, with yeah. no. I'm just saying yeah. it began with objects. It began with two Ian slammed chairs, yes, and a kissing ottoman facing each other, and in a in a woman's psychoanalyst office, and that being a kind of proposition to her patients to say. We are on a democratic plane, and I, I'm not going to put you on the couch, I'm not going to sit behind you, know, you're not going to be in your chair. Instead, we're going to be in this, you know, in this situation which has been designed to promote this, this kind of empathic exchange mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. us. And I think it's always proceeded from there for me, mm -hmm. in that sense of yes. its connection to, to objects. And how does it work in relation to provenance, for example? Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just curious about provenance in that, in that respect because obviously, yeah. you know, and that's like the one that seems one of the paramount ways in which you, this operation you're describing was, was put into uh, action. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think provenance is really particular because it's furniture yeah. and the furniture is anthropomorphic and therefore it, it suggests the human figure and you project, you project the human figure into the anthropomorphic chairs you know, because they are that. And so they, I think they become surrogates for people. And their diaspora becomes reflective of larger diasporas, whether it's diaspora or di the redistribution or distribution or however you want to say, the flow of capital or of people. 
in that respect. And that sort of shipping container scene, I think, mm -hmm. becomes very strangely <coughs> yes. evocative of, of multiple journeys in that, in that moment. But also because those objects, I mean, I like these in a sense, when those objects are objects that have been consumed uh, in a different kind of use. So they speak about a history of, of how they've, they've lived in the house, in Providence, I mean, in the houses yeah. people have been moved from place to place. I mean, I don't mean having I, a life of their own in an animistic way. I mean, more in, in yeah. a sense that objects themselves circulate and circulate ideas and circulate uh, construction of spaces, notions of living. But and, I think these, a, and these, how about these? You mean in terms of objects? Yeah. Because yeah. what I was going to say is that I think there's an analog between the collector's sort of homes where the furniture appears in provenance, which is sort of in the Hamptons and Antwerp and a yacht, and it's all very high-end and architectural digest, and the rendering images mm -hmm. that appear here, yeah. and the images that you pointed out, that there's a science fiction almost about these, these images yeah. right here, um, that somehow is, it has an analog to those, to the images of that because they create a kind of projective desire into a possible future. And the, the term animation seems quite yeah. spot on. Maybe I'm, sorry, no. Maybe I'm sorry, Craig's first question and is when Craig asked, why are we keeping this in the office? Why are we are not going anywhere else? Why is this the portrait of the architects uh, on the universal uh, line within the office space? And I think um, that that resonates with what uh, Office as a project is trying to do is to really analyze the mechanisms and the, the modes of production to understand the factory that is producing the architectural uh, um, um, world. And while there are many steps and many other stories that could depict, I mean, we have seen many other films that try to depict the architecture office or the architectural practice or the architectural profession but um, none that actually simply took that space that usually is the, the, the intermediary between subjects, right? Between objects of desire, either the building or the construction site or the meeting room. Here, in fact, it is that the space of interstitial uh, um, um, content that becomes the main subject. And, and that's perhaps the, the, the main statement that the, that the film uh, uh, makes in relationship to office as a project, right? That in fact we are really interested in the mechanisms of production. I mean, if this is a factory film, right? Uh, and and tries to really just simply understand uh, what kind of subject is actually looking into this film, and how do we feel in understanding uh, what are the questions that are being uh, like posed by the film? Are these interns? Are they paid? Are they uh, licensed? Are they, like, what are the questions that are being thrown through this lens beyond the, the simple uh, evidences that we can start thinking about the technology and, and uh, the idea of the chairs and the idea of comfort and the idea of luxury and the idea of views. I mean, there are so many things that have to do with the idea of the workplace that is a totally different conversation that is occurring in other circles of the field independently of its formal and, and, and uh, artistic devices. Um, I would like to open two questions into the, for the audience, so that's, that's why I was switching it. So um, maybe there are, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about the use of light. It's very diffuse and you can see the windows but there's no light coming in and it's so consistent throughout. I was wondering if you could comment on that. The use of light? Yes. Um, sorry, so you're saying that you can see what's outside? Yeah, you can see the windows, but there's no real light coming through. There's very little shadow, and it seems very consistent, and it seems like that would be a deliberate thing, and I was wondering if you could comment. Um, well, if, <laughs> I mean, it's actually quite simple. Um, there was you know, it's a sort of struggle that Gustave Le Grey encountered when he photographed, you know, the horizon and the landscape at once, and the sky is always a million times brighter than the landscape, but somehow you have to expose for one or the other. So one often research for a moment or this kind of period of time when the light is not so intense that it blows out everything around it, and there's you know multiple filters put in to sort of bring everything into a kind of um, relationship that's not so broad on the spectrum, but is a little bit more condensed. But I think there is actually um, 
there is some there's quite a bit of shadow in certain scenes there are in certain scenes yeah yes. and there's also a lot of curtains that, that are just the curtains that people use or the sort of you know shades that come down um, I think particularly in um, maybe it's still just the video and and where the is behind which is every yeah. every shot almost but um, there's this kind of play with them, with the blinds, and we sort of endlessly messed with the height of them, and which should be up and which should be down to create a kind of rhythm, you know, because it looks almost like a musical score as you pass through it. Well, I, I think for me, the lighting felt very fluid. Mm -hmm. and, um, I want to add something to the empathy of yeah. uh, conversation, <laughs> uh, if I may. I'm going to stay within the realm of the formal, but it has to do with the notion of pleasure. Because uh, I keep on thinking uh, about scopophilia, about the idea of the caress of the gaze. Uh, and one knows that there's a lot of it here. And I wonder why. And I think it has to do with speed, on the one hand, because uh, we are not in a still, but we are not either in our continuous rapid editing of the West. So there's something about the speed that allows us to have both concentration and distraction. And I think this reminds me a lot of traveling, traveling in a car or on a train, uh, not on a plane, when a plane you have you know, the clouds, etc. but mainly of traveling in a car or in a train, when you see the landscape go by and you can either focus or you can remain aloof, and, uh, and it gives you the possibility of being interacting, you know, thinking, but also of not thinking. And I have this feeling that in a way <coughs> that is very present in your films and that is why they're very pleasurable. And Provenance was extremely pleasurable also because of its, uh, you know, ruin the topic, you know. But here I have the same feeling and I think it has to do and that empathy might also come from this possibility of being both within and without what's happening. Yes. Yeah. And what's also and it's also because there's so many layers because the city is so present in so many of the takes. So you are like traveling, uh, not only traveling because of the of, of the apparatus, but you're also traveling within the city and looking at the city as if as if from the belly of the whale. And, the city. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for that comment. That's really um, interesting. I like your word um, caress. The caress of the gaze. The caress of the gaze because um, I think it's about the tempo, you know, the rhythm of it as it as it moves, and and the sense of the slowness is an act of anticipation. And there's two forms of anticipation. One is that you know lateral tracking shots always anticipate whatever is coming into the frame, so you always know that there's sort of more to come, but you're <laughs> moving at a very shall we say like slightly erotic you know speed because this it is this kind of slow build-up anticipation of something that comes in and, and pendular because it goes back mm. and forth so there's a pendular in the in the larger construction yeah yeah but it also you know i can add i mean to this it also i think plays with the idea itself of the the, the tracking Shot and the origin of it itself, I mean, or in French you say tabling, uh, in English is still a tracking shot, meaning it really comes from this idea of, of traveling, of, of the connection, of the invention, of the movement of cinema is moving images in relation to traveling to a train, traveling to tracks, actually train tracks, you know, the way in which similarly to here, you, it's as if you're looking out a window of a train, you can't really stop it. In the landscape or what you're seeing is it's going its, in its own speed and you are the passenger looking out the window. That's why, you know, to me, I was saying it, it reminds me of those panorama films in that respect, which, which were extremely seductive. I mean, there is a kind of yeah. And space. I think there's something about seeing everyone so intent, so That's focused true. inward. And that the inward yeah. focus sort of reproduces the state that you're in, even though they're not moving at all, but they're moving with wherever their screen is taking them. Yeah. Well, that, that sort of anticipated some of the things that I wanted to say. First of all, um, I think the uh, uh, cinematic references are very, uh, very suggestive. And a few more that one could propose, for instance, uh, you mentioned rope. I think there's also a good deal of rear window 
in the film in a way that our eyes are drawn to the windows, that we are intrigued about what happened outside, about the, uh, the relationship between the, the miniatures of the models and then the huge buildings that we have outside. And uh, I was also thinking uh, in relation to Godard that I, I probably would have chosen a slightly different film, namely Tout va bien, with shots, one which emphasizes the assembly line uh, uh, arrangement here, um, where, where Godard goes along the factory, cuts open the factory, and then of course the one at the end, which is that long tracking shot past the, the checkout market. And so that, that suggests these two sides of labor and consumption. And uh, of course it also reminded me of Sharon Lockhart's uh, lunch break, um, which is you know, not, a, not, not a lateral one, but it's a bit of depth along the wavelengths that you mentioned, but has that moment of inwardness and pause in an environment which is actually quite the opposite in a very noisy factory and it's all very quiet. And, and what you were just saying about uh, absorption, uh, indeed, uh, um, that was to me perhaps the most uncanny aspect of your film, just how absorbed and inward looking these people are on projects that are hugely influential and consequential to the outside, namely our built up space. In other words, the scariness of, of these people looking inward and looking into the screens and then their, their products uh, are so much what determines our public environment and that discrepancy between that kind of absorption in almost a kind of Freudian way um, and the consequences of the absorption being not at all inward looking but, but projective and outward going, that, that seemed to me a very critical aspect of the critical uh, import that your film has. Um, I, I have just a historical note that starts off with Giuliano's understanding of the, uh, the painter's studio in the 18th, 17th and 18th century. Fast forward to this, and, and somewhere in the middle is, uh, is an incredibly active physical uh, workshop. Uh, I remember starting out with uh, huge, what they call double elephant sized boards, which were tipped in front of you with T-squares which were longer than your arm, and you had to continuously move, wrestle with these damn things up and down, and then with paper you had to stretch it, and then with perspective you had to stretch string across the room and, and, and get the whole thing set up. And, and uh, it was so physically difficult that towards the end of the 19th century, the justification for not hiring women was that they were too weak uh, to indulge in this sort of male wrestling act with, the, with these double elephants and their T-squares and their uh, the, the physical nature of production. And then suddenly you cut to the, the chair and the stillness and the movement is all in the screen and you never see the movement on the screen in the film. So it was a, it was a complete erasure of, of movement in a production which actually, once it gets to be produced as a problem, for example, becomes an incredible production of, uh, of transport and movement and, and, and construction. Yeah, and that's, that's fascinating. I think we felt much more um, arcane than anything that was sort of like everything behind the camera and behind the camera, behind the line of the, of the lens. So sort of so 19th century still, even if it's a high-end digital camera compared to everything that was before the frame. You know, the sort of whole cinema apparatus is still such a labor-intensive, like when you describe that, that just feels exactly like everything we do all the time. Right. So, so bizarrely, um, and kind of wonderfully physical still. But um, I really appreciated also the Tubabian reference, partly because I wrote an essay about called Factories in the Factory about Godard and Warhol. And I wrote it up about numero due for the most part, but Tu Bien came up, and it's a sausage factory, right? Yeah. The, and it's like a vivisection of the factory that you see. And I was talking more about um, installation space and multiple screen use and the vivisection of, of, of that, as a, or the use of that as a kind of a vivisection in some way, introducing sort of slices of, um, of time. So that's, that's, that's great to, to consider, but I think in some way also this film I'm thinking now is perhaps, I grew up in Chicago and was perhaps also inspired in some way, but they have a vivisected human body at the
speak about transparency that's sort of like locked in acrylic or something like that. Oh. Hi. Um, I've got two technical questions and one that's uh, more thematic. Let's say. The first is I'm assuming that the, the dollies were set up along the hallways or uh, walkways. Yeah, they're sort of like at the place where the desks are between the desk and the wall, okay. usually. Because uh, Craig, your comment about the physiognomy of the office, I think, is interesting because one can begin to deduce sort of what the flow is, so to speak. Yeah, you see them because you're not always pointed, sort of, you're not always moving behind everybody or in front of them. You're often moving to the side of them. But when you move behind or in front of them, then you can see the entire space. And that's showing you where the wall is and also the alternative. You know, everything is, has a kind of a T possibility for movement. Mm -hmm. And it's actually that it's the it's the branch on the T that's my name. Because I'm really interested in the depth of field. Because the way things are layered up as we're moving laterally to me is one of the I would say um, beautiful effects that would be to your know, camera work. You're know, able to see the model and then the lamp behind it and the window and the city beyond. And it seems like and it's sort of Hitchcockian you know, in that there are some shots where everything's in focus, mm -hmm. and I don't know the technicalities of how you actually produce that, but I was curious, as a tool, how how do you decide depth of field? Is it something you did sort of as you want, or were there very specific decisions about what's in focus, what isn't? Because when something's fuzzy, it also reminds me of that caress comment, that there's a kind of fuzziness to it, you kind of want to rub up against it, and it starts to get into this empathy thing, which I think is truly problematic in this film, in a fascinating way, right? Because if you put this in the context of globalization, like what is empathy in that context? I think that's an interesting discussion. But in terms of the technicalities of the camera work, I'm curious about the depth of field and you know, what your decision process is there. Well, it's such a 19th century operation that there's a human being called a focus puller. <laughs> who is focusing to sort of mark out, you know, when in this choreography that I'm describing, one marks out where they want the focus. Do you want the focus to be set at all times in the back and therefore everything is in focus? Or do you want it to pull from object to object, let's say? And I mean, I, I can't tell you what the rule was because there's never a rule. And it's just, it's like a feeling, you know, and it's a conversation and it's sort of like, what does the frame look like and what are the objects in the frame? And how, sh you know, what is also the distance to the furthest point? And are there windows back there or is it just like a pin board of projects? And so do we want this? I mean, if you don't pull focus, it's going to also inevitably flatten a little. So I think that flatness tends to make things a little more banal. So one could say, do I want that or not in, in relationship to this environment? I think the rhythm that you create when you decide to switch directions somehow syncopates with the depth too. Because some shots have very deep, are deep, and others are shallow. I don't know, I thought that that, in terms of the rhythms that you create, and I do think that part of the beauty of this, abstractly speaking, are the rhythms that you're putting into play. My last question is sort of about the boundaries we cross with cameras, because cameras make people uncomfortable. Um, and I'm sure there were plenty of non-disclosure agreements involved with this filming. I mean, was there anything you really wanted to... Oh, okay, great. Transparency, we are transparent. Was there anything you wanted to film and weren't allowed to? What's you don't that? want to cross storefronts. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I know. collective. 
right? And hence the sort of collapse of it in some way into one unified architectural section or plan, um, the way it's edited together. Um, sometimes, sometimes the principle was, or the principles were present, but um, they're sort of powwowing in the frame, you know, with others, and you can't quite isolate them, or you would only know if you knew who they were. Um, but I think it was important, it was interesting to me that I think the smallest firm we went to, in just spatially and also in terms of employees, that the principles were present. Um, but there's also a kind of other presence to that scene, which is the scene where they have the kind of 50s music playing in the background and the multicolored you know, shelves and books and, and objects, and, you know, including Barbie and Tide and all kinds of um, wonderful things back there. And, and there's, you know, there's a different feeling there. And, and each office felt had a different feeling, but there's a quite a particular um, vibrancy to that to that scene. And you know, that's interesting to consider whether, like, is the, when the boss is here, do we? Um, you know, are we are we misbehaving, or are we all together and and kind of loving in our kind of are we performing for them? I don't, I don't know, but you know, we were in so many, also so big that we would we you know the the principals were tucked away somewhere, or they were on the offices to the side. Like there is a shot um, where somebody is, is sort of on one of the side offices quite quickly. It was you know a partner. And you can sort of see that because they're set out, and there's this suggestion of like not everybody's in the bullpen, right? And you know that was in some way the other reference for me was when I saw the offices at first, and I said to Ava, "This is this like Wall Street, or at least it's like my idea of Wall Street is represented in cinema." This is how I know what Wall Street really looks like. I know. Just because you were framed, and and this is an anecdote and. and when we were in Venice and we premiered the film and we were going to have this conversation, this film premiered in, in November. Um, Paul Katz, the man that you actually referenced to, he passed away that very Friday while the, the film was passing. I was reading the email that actually Jason Kemper, someone who she had been working with, and what was incredible is that. Regardless of the individual, regardless of the head or the principal of the office, one then understands that the big machinery of architectural production is, a, is an intelligence and is a collaborative effort that you can remove almost any one of us and, and the entire thing continues, right? So it was, and I just wanted to respond to your question because I think it was, it made even more evident into our skins as we just totally, just got totally cooled down. Um, of what it means, right, to, to have a people train everyone, and there are like at least four principles, also like in RBA and so on. So um, I just wanted to give you that note. It's not a it's not a happy one, but it's incredible to see to see that, right? Um, Opportunities um, for the field of architecture to um, be able to compete in a way that, that digital media or other fields are kind of um, making this formula a little bit more lateral, and the opportunity for other people like Google Ideas Office or other uh, formats of working. Um, sorry, my question isn't formulated very well, but. What are the other opportunities that architecture could learn from these other emerging ways of working um, uh, that you've observed after you know spending so much time with this kind of pyramid scheme? Yeah, I like I love the idea that I would have something to offer here. <laughs> it's like, you should see my studio. It's just a mess. It's just a total mess. Um, but no, I, I'm so, I, sorry. I really, no. More in the labor politics, like. Along the lines of the Lumiere brothers, uh, you know, release and you know, 
it is almost like this advertisement of like look how great it is that, that people actually get a break you know from working and these kind of long industrial hours yeah i just i'm i'm not one to be prescriptive and so i i think i just would, would not be able to that would be productive or helpful to anyone i'm, I'm more interested in, in sort of you know in uh, a depiction of what i'm seeing and that kind of representation or enactment of that one more question yeah when I've seen this film, I'm responding a lot to the images of the sky. I mean, when you look out the windows, here they are laboring inside this office, and then out there, it's like this transcendent. I'm thinking of these Monet picture paintings, and when you look across the river, and you see buildings there, and it seems like almost like you want to aspire to heaven in some ways, or to transcend the human state here on the ground. And you look at these offices, and they're filled with all these earthly objects, and million, million little objects to then create something like what we're seeing right here, where this architecture is, is very much, it's almost like, you know, it's attempting to touch divinity to me when I see it. And I think of even almost like the Tower of Babel, you know, that you're watching this guy placing the little figures in this, in this tower that he's making, and all these people laboring to create something like that, that's in, a, in an older biblical sense would be an offense to God, because it's, 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 create, it's attempting to do what God does. And I'm just watching all these people, it laid me like in an anthill, to build something that, in the end, it transcends. And, and it seems like when you, the pictures you've chosen on the walls are almost always at the building, a low angle, looking up at the sky, the approaching heaven. And I just wonder if that, if that is just my projection. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a little of both. <laughs> um, I think it's inevitably was interested in um, images of buildings that had some element of the skyscraper about them. You know, that they had some height and, and that they reflect, you know, the asper or the, that somehow they have embedded within them the aspirations that that kind of um, architecture reflects in some way, um, which much has been written about that. Did you want to? Okay. Um, <laughs> jumping in. Um, but I mean, again, I was more interested, I think, in the in that kind of science fiction quality that I spoke of before, and the sort of rendered environment as a projective environment, um, and that 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 in cinema was always a rendered environment out the window, or at least in my kind of proto Hitchcock reference, that it's a constructed environment, it's not real, and so the, they share that together. Sort of architecture and cinema historically share that kind of constructed space. Space note. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe some wine and some books. And we can all write an auto in his book that is back in the table.